Kobik is chasing our three musketeers, and he and his associate have a nice pair of Dobermans. Is it Dobermans or Dobermen? Anyway, while Dan and Mark duck into a vent in the side of a building, Steve has to head across the street to a similar vent over there somewhere. Kobik's dog has found Mark and Dan, and Kobik is going inside to find the other end of the vent. Suppose we also take a peek. We have your basic scientist type, played by Arthur Franz. It's Luca. What shall I tell him? And we have Helen of Troy. I mean, Nancy Pi Squared. I mean, it's Verda, everybody's favorite sentient android. Needless to say, Irwin Allen made use of D. Hartford's talents a lot. And for those of us who still have a soft spot in our hearts for Verda, brace yourselves, she's evil. They're both wearing lab coats, so they're both scientists, and that weird multicolored box on the table is their project. What is it? You didn't have to tell them the test failed. It's still in development. We're going to solve it. Out, I'm beginning to die. The vent is right there, and you know what's in it. You have no idea what's in that box, and this is a weird time to try and find out. Will you stop saying that? Are you going to let years and years of work just go for nothing? No. Let's run another test. Before Dan and Mark can move, that little door closes behind them. Whatever this test is, they have a front row seat for it. SID, open up! Open up! Where does the air vent come in from the alley? Who are you? This is government property. What do you want? Inspector Kovic, Special Investigations Department. How dare you arrest in here? But first, let's talk about overbearing, obnoxious cops. He came barreling in there with a clearly vicious dog, disrupting everything and failing even to identify himself properly, and these two aren't having it. Hey, this machine is worth millions of government dollars in five years of my husband's life. Who? Oh, oh, what are you at? Little people! They must have come in this vent. They must oh, still that? be in there. Good. We'll get them from the outside. I'm sorry to have been so abrupt, uh, Dr. Franson, is it? Mrs. Branson, sometimes the chase after the little people doesn't leave us much time for the amenities. My apologies, my identification. That's nice. Now get your boss over here at once because the four of us need to have a little talk about your future. They're not intimidated by his credentials or his dog. Sorry about the dog, but that machine generates a great deal of heat and the animal could have been injured. It could have more than just injured him, I'm afraid. The fact is the machine is powered by internal bursts of radiation at seven minute intervals. Yes, come on. Would you care for a demonstration? Here, just put your hand in this slot right here. Oh, get the dog out first. We try not to harm innocent animals. But our boys inside the machine have to do something quick because they have no idea where they are on that seven-minute spectrum. No amount of effort will get the door open, so there's only one thing to do. And if you think like I do, you've been yelling it at them since the moment the door closed. Kobik's dog has decided the little people aren't in the vent anymore, so the agent and his entourage move along. That's the opening Steve has been waiting for, but for some reason he doesn't go in the vent. He goes under the front door. Steve, this is a large, complex operation with computer banks taking up two rooms. You won't stop it by pulling the plug. Oh, he's using it. Never mind. On the table, he discovers that our scientists closed that vent. Hopefully that means no more random dogs will come barging in here trying to destroy everything. But it does raise the question, where are Dan and Mark? I can't raise it any higher. Steve! Give us a hand. There's radiation in here. Mark is trying to lever that door open with a lever that's way too short. Steve is about as much help as verbal encouragement. Too bad he didn't notice that great big wrench as he ran right past it. How much easier would these people's lives be if they would just listen to me? They're out and headed down that same electrical cord. In the next room, our scientists are baffled. This thing should work, but for incomprehensible reasons, it doesn't. Logan?
We have another failure. I don't understand it. And I won't accept it. And your alternative is... Logar is some kind of mid-level bean counter who's more or less overseeing this project. I have a feeling he knows as much about the actual science as Hazel does. Our spaceship will be ready for launch next month, and this guidance system must be ready to be installed in it. And if it isn't, it will be ready the next year or the year after that. The problems of space cannot be solved in a day. Commitments are made to be kept. I promised my best efforts, nothing more. At least now we know what that thing is. Logar softens and apologizes. It's pretty plain to see that he's getting pressure from the people above him, and he's just passing it along. But even he can see that yelling isn't going to make the project go any faster. But these dreams of ours, exploring Mercury, Venus, Earth, these delays make me impatient. He named the first three planets in our solar system using the names we've given them on Earth. So which planet are they on? I don't know that we ever find out. Not to mention, we got here through some kind of space anomaly. Is that how they propose to get to the planets they want to explore? And finally, if you're planning to visit the inhabitants of Mercury or Venus, take lots of sunscreen. It will happen, Logar. I promise you it will. We'll live to see the interplanetary exchange of goodwill. We have much to offer the men of other planets, and much to learn. Based on what we know of your government, Professor, I have serious questions about that goodwill part. At least the Professor thinks he's isolated the problem and takes Logar into the next room to show him. That gives Mark the opportunity he needs to get out of there. Except one part of him is still back there, his head. Hey, Steve. Come here, I want to show you something. These figures prove out. I can get us all out of here. You know what? I can get us back to Earth. I saw enough of their guidance system to know what's wrong with it. He's sure he can fix it, so he wants to make a deal with the professor. We help you fix your guidance system. You use it to get us back to Earth. Steve thinks he's crazy and says no. Right now we have a chance to get out of here, and I'm going to take it. You'd be committing suicide. I don't think so. What do you mean? And I don't care what you say. I'm going. Okay, then cut out. Go make your deal. I intend to. But I need at least two others to help me with the work. Valerie and Fitzhugh will volunteer. Steve won't try to stop them. All right. When you found out that you've walked into a trap, don't come running back here. I don't want any giants trailing into this camp. You get that? Again, we see Mark defying Steve's authority, but it's not as bad as episode 15 was. These episodes with Kobik were filmed in one order and then aired in a different order for who knows what reasons, and it shows. I get the feeling that when all the episodes were in the can, the production team sat down for a pizza and beer meeting to work on matters of airing them. I think if there had been a little more pizza and a little less of the other, the show might have come out a little more coherent. Steve follows them to the vent and gives them a pair of radios, just in case. <laughs> I want you two to go back to the edge of the park and wait. Why? A little while ago, you wanted us to wait here. And so I changed my mind. I'm going to go in and talk to them. When I make the deal, I call you. Oh, come on, Mark. Look, I can't... do it my way. Valerie, that phenomenon you're observing is called cold feet, at least in American slang. He's having second thoughts about involving the two of them in this, and suddenly he's not so sure he can make a deal with these giants. Basically, in spite of his best efforts to resist, some of the things that Steve said got to him. So he's adding an extra layer of caution since they have the technology in their hands to do it. It's nonsense to think a little people can help us. I questioned him for three hours. Everything. Mathematics, astronomy, physics. He knows more than we do. I tell you, Logar, he has the capability of helping us. He's talking to Logar, but Alpha is doing the answering. And what about his so-called deal about taking him back to Earth? Why not? It's little enough to pay. Well, it's against the law. Wasn't that SID man looking for the little people? The needs of the Defense Department supersede the SID. The Defense Department is overseeing this exploration project. If I mark the instant I hear that, I say, sorry, deal's off, and get out of there. Well, I won't have it. I won't have my husband give five years of his life to this project and, and then let someone else walk off with the credit. She thinks Mark is doing this for the credit? He'd just as soon not tell anybody he had anything to do with it. 
But as I said, our beloved Verda is evil this time. She's fiercely protective of her husband's reputation. Emphasis on fiercely. While they've been arguing, Mark has been inside the machine. He says he can fix it if he can bring in his helpers. Everyone agrees. Let me speak to Inspector Kovic. Almost everyone. If all the systems are off, I'm ready to start the modification. Well, before you do, I want to neutralize any possible residual radiation. The neutralizer is carried in superheated steam. I'll close the door. While that's happening, there's a knock at the door. The big one, not the one Mark just closed. Well, you're that say Well, you're from the SID. What do you want? I want them. Logar comes in and we get a jurisdictional whatchamadingle measuring contest. They head to the next room to put in a call to the Supreme Council and see who's is bigger. My dear inspector. Of course you can have them. A simple agreement. I use them for my purpose, a few days at most, then turn them over to you. Agreed. I guess it's a draw they can't find either one. Logar reports that Kobik won't bother them again. With that settled, the little people will get to work fixing things inside the box. A to B. Now we're out of synchronization on this bank. Tell them to take a break until I can find the trouble. The break she has in mind for them is a tad more permanent than what he was thinking. That's the superheated steam neutralizer the professor mentioned. Can't you open it? What happened? I don't know. There's a trip catch outside. It probably slipped. Mark? Mark says, look for a shutoff valve somewhere. It won't be until later that he'll wonder why he should expect one, since it never occurred to the scientists that someday somebody might be inside this thing. It'll take him long enough to figure that out, but Mark will finally do what I was practically screaming at them to do the first time they got trapped in this thing. Okay, let's get the other one. <coughs> exactly. Start breaking stuff. Break enough and Professor Oblivious over there is going to notice, which he does. Okay, let go. Let go! Finally, an alarm sounds and gets the professor's attention. There's back pressure on the steam line. What happened? Where are the little people? I don't know. What happened? What happened in there? We need ice water. What went wrong? I'll tell you later. Right now we need ice water for his hand. Alpha will take her own sweet time getting it, much less giving it to them. Poor Fitzhugh is in unbelievable pain. Your wife must have turned the neutralizer on. And she must have known we were in there. I did turn on the neutralizer, but I did not know you were inside the NMR. How could you be so careless? I looked inside. I'm so small I didn't see them. Our absent-minded professor is so naive where she's concerned, he'll buy the story and chalk it up to carelessness. So small, it's so hard to see. Will he be all right? Will he be able to go to work? I don't know. His hands are very badly burned. You will be able to get on with the modification. Your compassion for our injured friend is ankle deep, professor. Obviously, Fitzhugh can't do the job in this condition. Mark says, I can get more help, but it has to be on my terms and my terms only, or we're out of here and you can figure this thing out for yourself. Mark gives Fitzhugh a radio and says, remember what Steve said. Don't go to the ship. Call first. Fitzhugh. Fitzhugh, come in. Steve, we have an emergency message for you from Mark. May Valerie and I come to the ship. 
No. Don't you come near the spaceship. We must speak to you. We must see you. It's important. Okay. Fits you. Meet me at the at the big rock near the outpost. Steve won't meet them by himself. In fact, the gang's all here. Steve, he all worked out as Mark said. He can fix their guidance system. <gasps> what happened to your hands, Fitzy? I burned them. I can't work with them. Mark and Barry can't do the job alone. They need more help. Meaning Dan and me, I suppose, huh? Steve, they promised to take us back to Earth. I trust them. I don't. So you can tell. Get down! <laughs> I guess we know who's right. Steve and Dan zig while the others zag, and as they hope, the dogs are following Steve and Dan. They duck into a gopher hole, but unlike the last one, this tunnel doesn't seem to have a back door. These two guards seem to share a collective brain that contains maybe 18 cells, so they'll torment the little people by reaching in, firing blanks into the hole to bust their eardrums, and finally a flare to smoke them out. Now, they know Kovic wants these critters alive, and the stupid gunplay already brought a section of the roof down on Dan so he's badly hurt, but maybe somebody told them the little people are fireproof. These seem like the type who would believe it. Okay, you two giant intellects, let's take this step by step. You want them to come out. You put the smoke in so they have to come out. Then you stick a giant, almost white-hot flame in the entrance that they can't get past. Solve for X. <laughs> Correct. X equals move the flare out of the way, meathead. They stumble out, coughing uncontrollably. As if the net was necessary, but these two don't have the capacity to adjust their thinking to fit the situation. Training says drop net. I drop net. At least they won't do anything worse than bring them to the professor. Are these the two little people you were expecting to help you? Yeah, I was expecting them, but I wanted to bring them in my own way. Why'd you tell Colby? I told him nothing. Someone must have. Alta? It took him long enough. He calls her on the carpet for going behind his back and for the so-called accident with the neutralizer. She keeps saying, I did it for you. I know what's best for you. I'm protecting you, and I'm not sure he's listening. It was an accident. Alta? You are never to set foot in here again. Never. I wonder what the divorce laws are like in this place. He says, none of this was my plan. You're free to go. I'm not going to hold anyone against their will. Steve already left when the giants came in and Dan has been hiding behind the box. Mark says, if that won't convince you, I don't know what will. Dan is wavering. Please stay. Stay and help us. Okay, Mark, I'll help. Good. The two of us can finish the resynchronization. Very good. And sure enough, they do. Logar comes in just as the professor is performing a new test. It works. You're on your way home. You hear? That's all of us on the way home. We did it then. That's all Logar wanted to hear. Logar. Is that the cage the SID man had? Huh? Now that they've served their purpose, it will be necessary to turn the little people over to Inspector Kubik. Logar, there's a difference between necessary and expedient. State security is quite right. You people and your planet are dangerous because of your technical superiority. We had an agreement. In you go. Oh, my guitars, he's a true believer. In what way has their superior technology threatened you? 
What have they done to harm you? What sorts of horrible things do you think they want to do to your world? And if they do, why haven't they done it? My man, they don't even want to be here. They had no intention of coming here. And while we're on the subject, where is here? They don't even know that. If they did, they might have some idea how to get their ship back into the air and move along to not here. But there's no way out of this, so they may as well go quietly. Now that you little people have furnished us with a guidance system to reach Earth, I'll take care of you all. You can't do this. I can and I will. But the Defense Department and Supreme Council agreed. You agree? Agreements with little people mean nothing. Ouch. Nothing like reciting some of the darker parts of American history. People used to say the same thing about agreements with black people, i.e. slaves, and once the whole manifest destiny thing took hold, we said the same thing about first Americans. Now we have seven white Americans on the pointy end of that shaft. The lesson wasn't lost on us. It was right around this time, age 16, 17, when I started questioning my racist upbringing. Shows like this one, Room 222, and many others drove home the point that I ultimately made sure to teach my kids, people are people. Some are worth your time and effort, and some aren't. But you can't tell by looking. You have to get in there and be vulnerable. Open yourself up to people who look different, who have different views, who have different religions, who drive... Get to know people. I've done a whole video about my pseudo-brother Mark. If we had gone by appearances, we wouldn't have given him a second thought. But if you've seen the video, you know he became one of the most important and influential people in my life. Not bad for a homeless ex-heroin addict that society had already given up on. Logar is afraid of the little people because he doesn't understand their technology. He hasn't taken the time to learn about the people and what they're all about. They have widgets that he doesn't, so that makes them dangerous. And by the way, remember what I said about how Steve should react when he learned that the Department of Defense would be interested in this project? Now that you little people have furnished us with a guidance system to reach Earth, I'll take care of you all. Yeah, defense is a euphemism for war. Such departments exist to wage war against somebody, whether it's genuinely for defense or for conquest like he wants to do. If you want a peaceful world, keep your department of <clears throat> defense on a short, short leash. And for crying out loud, do not let them do the negotiating. That's how you end up with this guy. Isn't that? I'll worry about the morality, you worry about the engineering. Then I will inform the Supreme Council that I will not operate this guidance system. No one else has the know-how. You do what the Supreme Council tells you to do. We'll see about that. While they go storming into the next room to kick this thing upstairs, Steve is making his way into the room and up that electrical cord. Looks like Steve was right. Giants are no different than us. Some of them can be trusted and some of them can't. Yes, yes, please. What you have never learned, Franson, is that although technicians make the world go around, they do not run it. He says that like it's a good thing. People like him running things is why their world is an oppressive police state where people live in constant fear of their government. Then again, I have a feeling you couldn't fill an English teacup with what Logar knows about all this. So I'd bet he's secretly afraid of the professor, too. You never know when some of that honesty and compassion might rub off. He's heard rumors that the government is working on a vaccine. That's it. But what about my agreement? Logar's word to the little people. Why do I get the feeling he's getting the same answer from them that he got from Logar? They're just little people. It's not like an agreement with them means something. It's like making an agreement with your feeder goldfish. Wait a minute. Is there some way to destroy this guidance system? Yeah, there's a destruct button. We're there? Yeah. Wait a minute. But I'm not even asking why they put a destruct button right there where anybody could bump it by accident. Steve bumped it on purpose, which is all we need to know. So when that guidance system self-destructs, what happens to it? The 
The professor could have gotten clear if he hadn't stopped to check Logar's pulse. He should have taken the Wednesday Adams approach. Are they dead? Does it matter? Hey, thanks for watching. If you like what you see, please click the thumbs up. It really does help the channel. If you're not subscribed yet, the button looks something like this. So click it and join our little family. There's a bell there that may or may not actually work to give you notifications when we post something, but it can't hurt to click it just in case. You can also join our Patreon for as little as $2 a month and help me keep expanding and improving the channel. The link is in the description, along with links to a lot of other fun stuff I do. Again, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. She's fiercely protective of her husband's rep... One word at a time. And we get a jurisdictional whatchamadingle measuring... I can say that. Whatchamadingle measuring contest. Maybe I can't say that.